All right, guys. So we're going to do a quick um, video podcast. Uh, one of the things that I've tried to do is, uh, or been challenged, I guess, more than anything to do here in uh, in recent months is, especially when there's an issue that arises within the Southeast, um, whether it be different bills that are trying to be passed, whatever, I really want to be uh, as good as I can about using the platform to share information and to share um, how how people can um, can reach out to their representatives or whatever their the action that needs to happen. Uh, I want to make sure that that happens. And so um, we're going to use this time. We've got a uh, good friend, Clayton, uh, Clayton Bond, who uh, was on like what, a month ago, Clayton, when we were in. Yeah, Miss- yeah, ago, less than that. So uh, people know your voice, but now they get to see your beautiful face. Um, so that's hey. awesome. And we're joined by our guest of honor today, Mr. Glenn Adcock. Glenn, how's it going in uh, in North Carolina? Yeah, South Carolina, but we're doing great. I mean, South, South Carolina, sorry. I, <laughs> I actually, so funny story, I actually named this meeting, this Zoom video meeting, uh, North Carolina. And then I was like, wait a second, I think it's South Carolina. But yeah. Anyways, so South Carolina. That's right. Yep. Everything's good, man. We're having, having, a, having a good week. Um, and our deer season ended back on January 1st. And so it's been uh, playing catch up, taking inventory on who's left walking around in the woods and doing some little small game stuff and just trying to get some honeydews checked off the list that got put by the wayside during hunting season. But, yeah, it's going well. Awesome. Awesome. Glenn, tell me, tell me a little bit about what you do with, uh, with backcountry hunters and anglers, your, your position there in the state and, uh, and what you guys are doing right now. Yeah. Good. Uh, excellent. Be glad to. So a couple of years ago, there's a group of guys that, uh, started, uh, kind of posing the question about, um, starting a chapter inside, uh, South Carolina. And it was one of the things that had been kind of on my mind that we really needed because public lands here get kind of kicked and swept under the rug. And, and I helped organize and, and get the chapter started with a group of about seven or eight other people. And at the time, um, I took on the co-chair position and, and, um, mainly because of a time, you know, from a time issue uh, with my family and my business. And I was a lot older than a lot of these guys. And so I was just kind of using my contacts within the state and the DNR to kind of help them out. And then within the last six months, I've stepped in and, and if, and have taken over the chair position uh, temporarily. And so my focus and our focus as a chapter this year is one is just to kind of establish ourselves within the state. Um, COVID hit us pretty hard where we weren't able to do any in-person meetings for a long time. And we really weren't able to generate a lot of interest in the chapter and the organization as a whole. But more importantly, it kept us from really being able to do anything meaningful beyond just uh, some Zoom meetings, some educational stuff, and some cleanups, Um, but even those were difficult to do at times, and so we're really looking at 2022 as kind of a breakout year for us to really be able to do some good stuff um, in the state of South Carolina to help our uh, Department of Natural, Natural Resources and the U.S. Forest Service with any projects that they need, provide input, and, you know, just be another conservation watchdog for the public lands in South Carolina and make sure that they're toeing the line and doing their jobs that they say they're supposed to do. You know, I have, um, <clears throat> I'm a member of BHA. Uh, I do, uh, in, anytime there's a, an event down here in the Southeast chapter, uh, I, I guess Alabama doesn't have its own chapter yet. And so, uh, yeah. but we do quite a few events. Um, we've got one coming up here in March. Um, so I try to be as involved in that as I possibly can be. Um, but one of the things that I've noticed here in probably the last, definitely the last month, um, there's been several different things that have kind of come up um, against public land access uh, or th- things like that in Tennessee. As everybody, a lot of people know, there's, uh, an issue with uh, the state trying to basically sell off a big chunk of WMA property. Um, And 
the thing that I've noticed kind of is a common uh, a common theme is that BHA, which is Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, is always um, kind of at the forefront of whatever battle that might be against public lands. And, um, yeah. and, and I don't mean this as a dig at any of the other conservation organizations. They're all doing, uh, they're all doing things. It's not that they're not doing anything, but I always see BHA uh, kind of at the forefront. And not only that, but actually going out and trying to do something to change whatever it is that, that they're seeing happen. And I've always thought that that was, that was very impressive that BHA does that with, with people like yourself who are uh, most of the time just volunteers, just people who are passionate yeah. about the outdoors, passionate about public lands and passionate about conservation. And so uh, I've always thought that was, that was really cool. So Clayton, you're a, you're a hunter there in South Carolina. Um, it's what the, you know, the, you're, you're, that's where you enjoy your time in the woods, whether it be deer, turkey, uh, whatever. I want to know from you looking at it as a resident, have you noticed a change since the South Carolina BHA kind of hit the scene? Obviously it's a new thing. And as you said, Glenn, COVID hit, have you seen, um, some pretty cool changes within your state and within your public land? Well, just take, for example, like the issue at hand right now. So Sunday, Sunday hunting on WMAs is, is, is not allowed, right? And that's kind of what the purpose of this chat is. Um, and, and there's going to be some legislation, hopefully, that gets get, hits the ground running here in the next couple of weeks uh, to kind of overturn that law. But as, as of current now, you're not allowed to hunt on Sundays on state-owned or WMA lands uh, in the state of South Carolina. You can hunt private lands, but not public lands. So... To, to loop back to your question, um, really like the, the first time that I like came to understand that like th this was something that was getting brought up was through BHA. Um, I'm not a member of BHA. I, pro I should be and I will be soon. But um, I saw it on like a Facebook post or something like that. I'm pretty sure from Glenn or, or somebody else in, that's part of the group. And I was like, that really strikes a bone with me. Like, there's no reason that we shouldn't be allowed to do this on Sundays. So, I mean, literally I became an advocate for this and became involved because of a post from BHA on Facebook. Um, so, I mean, to loop back to that. Yeah. I think it's cool. Um, both Glenn and Clayton are both here. As you said, Clayton, you're not a member of BHA, um, but you are going to be soon. I think this is kind of the, this is kind of, this is a, a really cool part about what BHA does is that you guys, I know in my state, uh, in Alabama, and I'm good friends with a lot of people who are part of the Tennessee chapter. Um, and you kind of see, you kind of see that, uh, these volunteers and these people who are not only the volunteers who are, you know, working and on the, on the board of whatever state or chapter it is, uh, you're seeing regular guys like Clayton who are, who have this passion for the outdoors and want to do something about it. And I think one of the hardest things for us to do for, for just regular, just regular hunters to do is know the proper steps to, um, to go through the proper avenues to go through, to actually have your voice be heard. And I think BHA uh, does a very good job of that. And Glenn, we're going to, we're going to use you today to, to tell people how they can do something about it. But before we do that, I, I want you to kind of lay it all out there this issue as clayton said sunday hunting is kind of the the theme of it um i want you to just as best as you can lay it all out there as far as what is actually going on yeah one thing i want to touch on too just uh to, if i could backtrack just a second to what you were talking about as far as uh backcountry hunters and anglers the the thing that attracted me to this organization and i i kind of came into it um late and it was one of the it's one of those groups that started in the west and then just has kind of trickled slowly and you're right alabama doesn't have its own chapter they're incorporated in what's called the southeast chapter of bha um, and i'm not sure how you know that particular southeast chapter works but the thing that was attractive to me is and I'm a wildlife, you know, I'm a former wildlife biology major, um, and somehow or another, um, you know, God chose to route me in through vet school, and so I never, um, never 
spent a day as a practicing wildlife biologist, but uh, you know, uh, there's always been this kind of conservation bug and and wildlife management bug and itch that I've never really been able to fully scratch. And with most of the organizations that you see out there that label themselves as conservation groups, what you have is you have you have a set number of board members and lobbyists, and then and then fundraisers that are employed to to make sure that the chapters are generating enough funds and then all of the members that are under there you'll have some volunteer stuff but it's mostly keyboard conservation they're just clicking and sharing articles and complaining a lot when i got exposed to people that were actual members of bha and luckily we've got a really good strong chapter just across the line from us in north carolina what i saw was from the board all the way down to the members in the state these people want to be physically and intentionally active in what's going on in their state. They're wanting to get out and do cleanups. They're wanting to hang signs. They're wanting to go and speak at these meetings. And they're not sitting back relying on their dues to do the work for them and then complaining that that, that the stuff that they want done is not getting done. And it's a tough sell. Like BHA is a tough sell in the Southeast because especially in today's climate, because nobody, I mean, you can't separate politics from your lunch menu these days, you know, so, you know, people will boycott a restaurant simply because somebody who was on the opposite side of the political aisle endorsed it one day and, and living in the Southeast in a really conservative part of the country, people tend to associate backcountry hunters and anglers with a very liberal anti-hunting mindset. And so it's been, it's, it's been a tough sell. And I've got friends of mine, really good, close personal friends that don't want to be involved simply because the optics of it don't fit the narrative of what is considered to be traditional um, well, approaches. True or, false, true or false here. Um, from what I've seen, now, and I, I could just be looking at this wrong, and I would I would definitely consider myself to be conservative, and I understand the issues. I've had these conversations like this with all kinds of people that are, you know, a, a part of BHA. Um, <clears throat> but it does seem like anytime there is a, a threat to public lands, it tends to come from the right. It tends yep. to come from Republicans, and so I... I Obviously, I look at a, a full picture when I think about politics, um, when I think about just it, we don't even have to talk about necessary, necessarily the issues at hand. But when I look at a full scope, uh, obviously, I'm going to find myself more on the conservative side of things like most hunters, honestly, in the southeast are going to are going to fall. But when you look at this one issue and you say or, or not, maybe not just one issue but when you look at the issue of public lands um it definitely seems as though uh you know i i can get behind just because i i don't necessarily agree agree with the full spectrum of what um the the, a, a democratic agenda is uh i can find myself in a situation where i could say i i agree with that and i think that's important i think that's just important that's what you're talking about it's what when you talk about like you can't even order off the menu at some restaurants yeah. anymore <laughs> politics should not be so deeply rooted in every decision that we make and cool. so that you know I, I think i think maybe a lot of it is just pure ignorance from people and i don't mean that in a in a in, in any kind of like slight i mean that in like people just don't know that this right. stuff is going on and they can't imagine that politicians are doing something shady, you know, <laughs> that's, that's right. Yeah. And, and, you know, and one of the things that you, that people can get kind of tripped up on is looking for that political purity in all aspects of their life. And it's just going to leave you frustrated and angry all the time. But, you know, that, and so that, that in and of itself is what really attracted me and, and the, the, um, Cody, who, who was the initial uh, chair of the South Carolina chapter, uh, you know, he, he and his wife just had triplets or not triplets, twins. And, 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 and through time constraints, we had people that were really, you know, 
uh, kind of was like wondering, you know, when are we going to start doing stuff? What's going to happen? And so my role is I just wanted to jump in and help him. And that kind of speaks to the chapter as a whole. We just, it, it, it attracts people who want to physically and intentionally get out and do the best job that they can to improve public lands and hunting in general across the state, but especially public lands because BHA is a public land access group. That's, that's the, one of the core principles. Um, and so then that brings us to this issue that we've had this, 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 um, this, this restriction on hunter access to public lands on Sundays. And, you know, I grew up in Opelika. I don't know if you, you know, if you're familiar with that area, um, right outside of Auburn and, you know, from the day that I could walk, it was seven days a week. I mean, we could go and hunt. You know, if I wanted to hunt Tuskegee national forest, I go hunt Tuskegee national forest. I, you know, and if I wanted to go up and uh, up around Talladega and hunt up in those, you know, in, in the mountains up there, there was never any issue. And so outside of that world that I grew up in, I never knew that there was a, such a thing as a Sunday hunting restriction. And, and, you know, you can you can vouch for it just as well as I can that, it, it, you know, mo a lot of people consider Alabama to be the buckle of the Bible belt. And so it, it was I, I just coming from a very religious family and and have been taken to church since I was old enough to walk. I I couldn't. It, it was just beyond my comprehension. And my first experience with no hunting on Sunday was in Virginia when I lived up there. And we were talking about that before you started recording. Um, and I think they finally got some of that straightened out. And then North Carolina followed suit a couple of years ago. And so, you know, luckily here we are in South Carolina, finally starting to make some headway and hopefully be able to get this thing, uh, turned around. Um, you know, is this, but, just a, is it just a blue law? Is it kind of the same thing as yeah. not an alcohol or whatever? That's exactly right. It's just a leftover blue law. And, and it was, um, you know, but I always found it odd that fishing was okay on Sunday, but not hunt, but not hunting. It's, and so there's, there's a little bit of hypocrisy in the way that those blue laws were originally written and the, the things that were restricted. Um, but, uh, I, I'll have to give kind of a tip of the hat on, the catalyst for all of this really came from John Kulkelsher and the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation and the National Shooting Sports Foundation. Um, and as a group, they're the ones that kind of put this on, on the radar and started kind of needling our Department of Natural Resources about, hey, why are y'all still holding on to this, these antiquated uh, or the, these, these and not antiquated, these antique restrictions that other states, like you're surrounded by states that provide seven day a week hunting. And, and, and that really is what kind of spearheaded and jumped this off. And DNR saw that it was going to become an issue. And so they started trying to uh, kind of get out in front of it a little bit. And the way that that started, it started out with these public input meetings and we had uh, five public input meetings and an online survey. And over the course of this past summer, back in 2021, and luckily we were able to attend all five of those meetings. Um, all of our people filled out the surveys. There were a lot of surveys that were filled out. And overwhelmingly, once once that once the survey information and the information from the public input meetings was analyzed by Clemson University, it's two to one in favor. And so it's not even close. It wasn't like it was, you know, 55, 45. I mean, it's a two to one overwhelmingly in favor of overturning these Sunday hunting restrictions, either completely or with some form of modification and, and that in and of itself, uh, and we really pushed it out last summer to try to get people there and bring this to everybody's attention. 
because a lot of people were just kind of asleep at the wheel. They just figured this is the way it's always going to be. This is the way it's always been. There's no sense in even trying to change it. And you get enough people making enough noise, and then they see 66% of your constituents want this done. Now, all of a sudden, you got to do something about it. Um, it's so odd our, to me. It, it's so weird to me. Like you said, like it is weird because I don't, you know, I don't know anything about about that as far as hunting is concerned. Like I, I've never lived anywhere that that was a thing. But I mean, like, what does it? What's the benefit of not having Sunday hunting? Like, what what is the benefit that? What is the reason for that one third to vote against it? You know what I mean? Like I. Well, yeah. It, it's multifaceted and it, and it really depends on what part of the state you're in. <clears throat> Excuse me. When we, that, that first public input meeting, Clayton, I, you weren't, weren't you at that one in Pickens? Yeah. Yep. yeah. So he can, he can back me up on this. That was an entertaining place up there. Um, and I love that area. I mean, it's where we do our bear hunting. I've deer hunted up there. I've trail ran up there for, you know, for a long time. Uh, and so it, you won't find a, a much prettier area in, in the in the southeast. But their big um, uh, issue with it came from the religious side of things, which to me I found kind of puzzling because Sunday hunting is already legal in South Carolina just on private land. But the focus up there in that in that district was on the religious aspect and that Sundays are for church and you shouldn't be hunting on Sunday. The further south you moved, and so we moved down into the Midlands, Piedmont region with these meetings and then ran them all the way to the coast. And the the further south you went, it became more about the, the non-consumptive users well, what are, you know, what are the mountain bikers going to do if they don't have one day a week that they can ride, quote unquote, safely? Uh, we got the same input from the equestrian groups and, and the horseback riders is that um, is that they wanted one day a week where they and I'm and I'm using quotes here, felt safe riding their horses. And when we were at these public input meetings, I asked these people, I said, I would love to see the incident reports from all of these near death experiences that, that you guys are talking about. And of course, there's no data for it because they don't exist. And I'm not saying that they, that these people haven't had incidents and I don't want to be to sound like I'm being dismissive of their concerns, but we can't we can't rely on anecdotal evidence of one time a guy said something mean to me when I rode my horse by a tree that he was in. It, I mean, you're going to have jerks no matter where you go. And and so th those were the two main ones, religious and and then the uh, multi use non consumptive users of public land wanting a quote unquote safe day to be out in the woods, even though six out of seven days you know the the big thing the main reason any incident happens and any injuries occur during hunting season is from us not being safe and falling out of our own trees and you know luckily saddle hunting cured that problem for me but it's uh it it there's no incidents or data to support that hunters and non-hunters are having these these violent injuring you know bodily injuring or life-ending conflicts on public land it's just not happening and then of course you've got people that are just ingrained in traditional use practices this is the way it's always been six days a week on public land has always been fine i've always been able to get my deer without having to hunt on sunday or i just go hunt my buddy's private spot on sunday well that's good if you've got a private spot to go and hunt but if you work five, five and a half, six days a week, and you don't have that private spot to go hunt, then what's a guy to do in, at that time frame? Um, and, and as somebody with a scientific and a, bi, in a, in a biology background, uh, the one that just cracks me up the most is that animals need a day of rest. 
is, you know, we got to give the animals a rest day. That deer doesn't know if Sunday from a Monday, you know, and, and so I, I can't wrap my mind around that. And, and I think what it is, is that people in, in South Carolina is one of those states, and there are others that, that are the same, is that people want stuff to be different, but they don't want to change anything in order for things to be different. And one of the one of the things that I have preached and talked about, especially in these public input meetings, is that hunting, just like anything else, is is responsive to supply and demand. And so this excuse of, well, our, our public lands aren't that good. We, you know, we're not Iowa and Missouri where people are traveling here to, to hunt big deer. And so the economic impact studies that, and, you know, we presented them with all of the economic impact studies and how much money this is going to bring into the state. None of that landed because we're not a quote unquote big deer state. And my response to that is, is that, well, well, don't you want to be? And the way that you get there is you put more demand on our public lands. And, you know, because the other thing was, it was like, well, if you open it up on Sunday, now public lands are just going to be overrun and crowded. And there's going to be, you know, a pumpkin in every tree, a hundred yards apart. And, and I kind of replied to that. I was like, well, good you know because if you've got more people that want public land that's going to put more pressure on the dnr to buy more public land so that you can spread people out give people access to more property and i'll go ahead and just tell you one of my pet peeves the department of natural resources just purchased um 23 acres on james island on the coast on the coast heavily developed beach houses everywhere grocery stores on every corner and they bought 23 acres from a uh, from a, a Catholic nun monastery for 23 million dollars. They paid those people a million dollars an acre for 23 acres of land that you're not even going to be able to do so much as kill a squirrel off of. You back that property up 25, 30 miles off the coast and get it out in the into the rural area. Do you know how many acres of public land you can buy for 23 million dollars? It's a lot. You can actually buy a 500 acre section of land just for horseback riding and put barns, wash down racks, stocks, places for people to park their trailers and have another $22 million left over to go <laughs> buy more land. You know what I mean? And so I want, I want this thing to pass number one, so that the DNR will start caring more about the property that they own, because if we care about it, then that means that we're going to be a better watchdog for them. And the more people that we have, whether it's people coming in from out of state or in-state hunters, it puts more pressure and more eyes on the ones who we have tasked to take care of our resources, take care of the animals and improve our public lands. Um, I got kind of tangential there, so I apologize. I lost my train of thought a little bit. That's fine. That's fine. We, I want to get into this actual, because uh, I agree with everything, and I think it's, I think it's good for people to hear what, what you say as a, as a, as a member of this board or, or whatever for BHA there in South Carolina to kind of know the heart behind it. And <clears throat> it's not just a, because some people might look at it and be like, well, what the heck is wrong with, not hunting on Sundays. It's just one day. Like y'all are making a big deal out of nothing. Well, it's more than that. It's a, it's a, it's an opportunity, um, to do, to be given an inch and take a mile. Correct. Is there, it's, there's a humongous domino effect. So I think that was, I think that was a great tangent. I don't think it was at all, um, uh, off of the point of this, but I do want to hear about the actual bill, what it says. I know you mentioned that there are some, uh, it, there are some at least points of it that are just movement, like at least some changes. And then there's the overall, like just yeah. being able to hunt on Sundays, period. Yeah. And so what, uh, uh, what Bobby Cox, one of the state reps uh, in the, in the house, 
when he introduced the bill. And right now the bill currently had, last time I talked with him um, at the uh, beginning of this week, there were 20 co-sponsors on the bill. And his bill is pretty much a sledgehammer approach. We want complete, uh, all restrictions lifted, uh, all seasons, all weapons on all uh, WMA land, whether it's national forest, state-owned, or private lease that's in the WMA program. What the DNR is going to come back with and, and kind of what we expected is, you know, we start on one end, you start on the other, and we just kind of work towards a compromise. And so right now, um, this thing's uh, been pushed into the wildlife subcommittee. And the other thing that they're waiting on is some revisions and some amendments from DNR. Uh, one of the things that they're concerned with is that the private lands that they do lease that are in the WMA program, they want to make sure that, that this doesn't violate their, uh, their lease agreements that they have with these private landowners. The other thing too, is they're looking at, uh, again, the multi-use practices of equestrian groups, mountain bikers, hikers, things of that nature, and the areas that they have and, and where they, you know, they're commonly accessing land for, for their trail rides and trying to figure out do we need to put a buffer around it, you know, no hunting within a couple of hundred yards, or do we just need to say, you know, this, this area is no hunting on Sunday, but you're good Monday through um, Saturday. The, the other thing that, that, that um, looks like they're going to do is to roll this out in phases. And so our deer season starts extremely early here um especially in the lower part of the state it starts august 15th and for you know velvet bucks only and then uh game zone two and we get we get started september 15th with archery season and so we have more of a archery season primitive weapon season and then rifle season whereas down in the low country it opens up August 15th and it's gun, bow, truck bumpers, hand grenades, whatever you got. I mean, it, the, there's no restrictions on the weapons. And, and so they're looking at um, basically making it where the starting the Sunday after Thanksgiving, you get to deer hunt every Sunday, the Sunday after Thanksgiving to the end of the season. And then through January for um, small game season and then shutting small game season on Sundays down in February. And they're not looking to give any days on public land during turkey season. And the reasoning behind that is they want, um, according to the biologists that I've talked to, what they want is they're in the middle of a research project and, and uh, data acquisition uh, because of a new um, telecheck app in South Carolina's late to the game on, on just about everything. And so <clears throat> last year was the first year that we had an app and it was only for turkeys that you could check your turkeys in. But beyond that, you know how Tennessee's is like that thing's just beautiful. George's is the same way. Um, and, and where you can purchase your license, put it on auto renew, um, access maps for public lands, you know, and, and, and check in all of your game. And so South Carolina started that telecheck last year, and it's really kind of given them an insight on when the turkeys were killed, where the turkeys are being killed, <clears throat> and they would like at least one more year of that data before adding an extra day of, of what they consider extra day of pressure to those public lands during Turkey season. Now to me, that and, sounds like a valid reason. I yeah. You, that. yeah, I you can, that. we need a day of research. Yeah. Because turkeys are a, a fragile subject right now. I mean, in, in the past several years, the, it's, it's, it's a 
big, huge thing that people are talking about. States are trying to figure out the best way to manage their turkey populations and uh, <laughs> kind of get over this decline that we've seen all over, really all over the Southeast. So I get yeah. that. I mean, I, I can, I can pretty easily get behind that. That seems like a good reason. It's definitely a better reason than, well, I, I need a day to ride my horse or, um, or just, or not it's just always, it's just always been like that. So why change? Yeah. 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 It's just, it's, that's what gets me the most is like, all right. If you look at basically 40, the 40, 48 other States in the country that have unrestricted Sunday hunting, like, it's like, okay, maybe, maybe we should get on that wagon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and that was one of the things that I brought up at, at the, um, at the meetings and through emails and phone calls. I mean, we've spent just hours upon hours of talking to legislators, talking to, uh, DNR officials and, and speaking at these meetings, writing letters. And the thing that I kept going to, I was like, you guys need to be comfortable in looking at, at some at, at other states that have done this and have continued to do this very successfully and don't be afraid to copy what they're doing and and so I, I challenged them with all of these things that have been brought up the day of rest the uh, the equestrian groups and the horseback riders the mountain bikers uh, all of the I said go to Georgia Ask them for the data on the incident reports and the conflict reports. Go to Tennessee, where you hunt, I hunt uh, every year. They've got the data. If it exists, they should have it. And so why not use that? And, and again, I mean, you, you mentioned um, ignorance. Well, there, there's a difference between being ignorant because you simply don't know something, but there's but that's different than being ignorant because you don't want to go and ask somebody for help in that, in this process in South Carolina, for some reason or another, our department of natural resources and our legislative body are like, there may as well be a border wall around South Carolina because they're going, they're, they're going to try to figure out their way to reinvent the wheel, no matter how it's been done. And so, and, and it's not just necessarily looking at the successes of these other states, but going and looking at the mistakes that they've already made, right? How would it be? I mean, would you trust me if I came out of vet school and was like, hey, did you ever look at the data on the mistakes that were made with this other stuff? It's like, nah, I'm just going to wing it, dude. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, that doesn't really sit well. And we've got some really smart people. But the problem is, is that we've got this system that's ingrained and we've got smart people that want to do good work and they're handcuffed by a system that thinks that they can just figure this all out on their own. And wouldn't it be easier just to go and look at the places that are already doing this and doing it very well, very successfully with thriving game populations, people crossing the state lines and just pouring money into these states year after year after year and going you know what i think they've got something figured out let me see if i can't go and take bits and pieces of what they're doing and see how it applies to our state and what we have you know um and when we look at it from bear season to deer season small game turkeys all of that stuff comes into play you you've got people that already know what to do they've made the mistakes they've made some adjustments you can literally start out on third base if you want to and and not have to learn from home plate if that makes any sense well and it, and it's good that you guys are able to kind of come in at, at what seems to be a good time uh and when i say y'all i mean backcountry hunters and anglers and be kind of an accountability system for this uh, and, and make sure that the voices of uh, outdoorsmen are being heard and being acted on. Um, yeah. And, you know, obviously sometimes it's not going to work out. Sometimes they're not going to listen and they're not going to do uh, anything, but at least you get to be a voice that gets more voices together. You know what yeah. I mean? And so that's I, right. It's perfect. 
Yeah, you know, and, and and Parker, I don't have a whole lot of talents, but one of the talents I do have is I recognize talent, and and I I've recruited some board members to help us out. That these guys aren't afraid to make phone calls. Um, they're not afraid to ask the uncomfortable questions. I tend to always be just a little bit too passive in my approach to things, and so it's real good to have people that. Um, can be a little bit more aggressive, but in a very diplomatic and nice way about, uh, you know, just uh, like I said, just asking the hard questions and getting the information out of people. And so I, you know, main thing I want people to understand uh, about our chapter and the uh, South Carolina chapter of BHA is that I'm not always the best. And, and, you know, my wife will tell you, I haven't, I, I have a little bit of an aversion to not an aversion to social media. I just forget to check it, you know? And, uh, and so it's good that I have, uh, people like my wife, my wife is a board member as well. And she handles a lot of our social media and event stuff, but she also works with and partners with the Artemis women's group here in the state of South Carolina. And so trying to generate interest from from the women hunters that we have as well and if people think that there's not stuff happening just because they don't see it on social media i can promise you we're we're talking every day uh, we have we have a group text that we're talking you know and i'm talking to these guys every day um we have an email chain that we're communicating with we're making phone calls not just to each other but we're talking to these uh reps we're talking to the dnr we're talking with the congressional sportsman's foundation uh national shooting sports foundation where you know we're really um trying to get as engaged as we can with these groups and a lot of that stuff is happening under the surface and so people don't necessarily see that and, you know, we've got a couple of events coming up. One, we've got a uh, just a pint night happening down in Charleston in March. But in April, we've got a three-day event where uh, we're uh, camping and then uh, at uh, one of the state parks. And we're going to spend three days chasing turkeys on public land and catching fish and talking about uh, uh, we've got a board member from Turkeys for Tomorrow that's coming over to talk. And so there's stuff going on. Um, it's some of it's really boring and it's very clerical and, and it's not always sexy, but unfortunately, when you start talking about politics, that's exactly what it is. And, and as far as our involvement, I think that we've done a pretty decent job, not a perfect job, but we've done a decent job of being able to get our foot in the door and establish ourselves uh, as a as a group of people who are very concerned, but we're also willing to help. And you know, we're not a mudslinger group. We're not going to sit there and bash these people on social media, blame them for all, all the problems, and then also expect them to have the solutions to those problems. And again, just like we talked about at the beginning, that's one of the things that really attracted me to this group is because the type of people that it attracts are people that don't just come to the table with problems. They come to the table with problems, solutions, and they're willing to put the sweat equity in to actually help solve those problems. That's right. That's right. So speaking about solutions, obviously, number one course of action, maybe not number one, but one of the courses of action that somebody from south carolina can do is become a member of bha it's very easy to do um, yeah. go to the pint night check it out online uh, so that I, I would imagine that would be one of the things that somebody can do to be a part of this but clayton if you can go ahead and pull that up on your screen um we're going to give people and, and glenn I'll, I'll let you kind of explain what this is that he's pulling up here but give sure. people uh, a, um, a route basically that they can take to make sure that their voice is heard and that a lot of these issues can, uh, can be settled. Yeah. So what you're looking at here is this is on the, uh, backcountryhunters.org, um, main website. And so this is the, the national page and what Clayton has pulled up is what's called a call to action report. 
and basically it talks about legislative issues that are going on in different states and this one is specific to the sunday hunting uh, lifting the sunday hunting, sunday hunting restrictions um, in south carolina <clears throat> it's got the bill number but the beautiful thing about this is it's pretty much maintenance free i mean you know we live in an amazon society people want it they want it yesterday and the easier you can make it for people to do things, the more participation you're going to get. And so the resources that we have available through BHA National uh, are, are just incredible. And the fact that we have access to this, where all you have to do is you go in and you put in your, your name, your email, and your zip code. And it goes and it finds your representative. But this one also has all of the board members on these committees as well. And so when you fill this information out <clears throat> and you hit send email, it's going to send it to, it's going to send that same email, that same letter to all those members of that committee. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I, I did this, uh, several days ago and it, it had confirmed with me that it had sent the basically an email to all of the committee members um so like glenn was saying it's super easy like if, if this is something that you feel is worth standing up for and you want your representative in this committee to know that you know you care about this issue uh, there will be a link in the at the bottom of this video where you can just click on it and it'll literally take you directly to this page um, and then also, I just want to point out, there's the same thing on the Safari Club International's page, and I did this one as well, and it basically emailed directly to uh, to my representative for my local area, I guess, based on my zip code, um, and sent, you know, something very, very similar to what the uh, BHA page sent, and we'll include yeah. this link too. Yeah, so both of these, like Clayton said, both of them will be at the link below in this video. Um, there'll be two different links right there. Now, I have, a, I have an important question for guys who may be watching this or listening, and, and maybe they don't live in South Carolina. Maybe they don't, um, but maybe they hunt there. You know, people who live in North Carolina, I imagine it's not uh, rare to have somebody who frequently hunts South Carolina or from Georgia or, or you know, a surrounding state. Um, is there any action that non-residents can take um that would be similar to this yeah absolutely yeah they they just need to follow those links because it'll absolutely send that email and um the other thing that we have is on our facebook page and if i'd have been better prepared i would have, I would have been ready to uh send you that link as well but contact those legislators because the one thing i know that politicians care about is they care about money and if if you if if you do not or are not a South Carolina resident, let them know. Hey, this if you lift these restrictions and open Sunday hunting, that's going to make me want to travel to your state more, and and hunt there and spend my money there. And I'll give I'll give you an example. I'm going out of town next weekend to uh, meet up with some guys that I hunt in Tennessee with, and we're going to a piece of public land in, in, in Tennessee, and we're going to do some postseason scouting. We're going to go and, you know, kick thickets and all that stuff. So I'm driving up on a Thursday. So I'm going to be buying gas in Tennessee. I've got to, um, I've got to buy food there. We're, uh, we're renting an Airbnb while while we're there um I'll, I'll be camping one night and then we'll be in the airbnb the other two nights and so between between a couple of guys we're going to drop in the course of about three days around thousand fifteen hundred dollars now you spread that out over seven days when we go and hunt for a week and what does that look like and i mean if you add those two extra uh, you know an extra day bookends on the end of a 10-day trip right you got a week off, you're going to leave on Friday night or Saturday morning, you're going to hunt Sunday to Sunday. The economic impact that that has, that's what out-of-staters, people that are out-of-state that are looking at South Carolina as a potential place to come hunt, let them know. Adding that extra day definitely factors into making that decision for, for you. 
uh, because I know it factors into making that decision for me. And politicians understand one or two things. How are they going to keep their job and bringing money into their districts? And if they can do those two things successfully, which this bill does, I think, because you've got 66% of the constituents in the state that say they want this to happen, plus the people from out of state, I mean, we'd love to have you guys come and hunt here. Like I said, the more pressure you put on our public lands, the more attention that has to be paid to them by our Department of Natural Resources. That's right. That's good stuff, man. And, uh, and I, I look at a state like South Carolina, where the season opens so early, but I don't really see a whole lot of people who travel to hunt there. Um, and most of the time you look at Florida, Florida Osceola's, it's a tough hunt down in South Florida. Like that's a tough hunt. People go down there and get their butt beat and they pay to do it. And the reason they do it is because they can do all that before their season ever even opens in their state. Yeah. People you th- want to be able to go and hunt earlier than they're used to. And, but if you look at it and you look at the logistics of, well, there's going to be a day or two days possibly in this trip that I'm not even going to get to hunt. Right. A lot of people make their decision based on that. I know I sure would. So I think that's uh, I think it's valid, man. And I think it's, I think it's good to get that out there. Yeah. You think about, and, and um, I think it was, uh, I think it was you Parker that I saw either this past year, or year before um, where you, you killed your first velvet buck in Tennessee on the Tennessee velvet hunt. Was that you? Uh, so no, my buddy Adam that. did on that video. Okay. So imagine the economic impact, right? If you, if you could, as in the state of South Carolina, you say one of two, maybe three places in the, in the nation that you can come and actually hunt of a velvet deer, you know, Tennessee's got the velvet was a two day velvet hunt now. Three days. Yeah. Um, and then there are some places out West where the mule deer season opens up early enough that you still have a chance of tagging a, a velvet deer. But really beyond that, that's it. And, and, and you think about the, the amount of attention that that would gather. It's like, hey, come hunt South Carolina. You want to kill a big velvet buck? This is the place to do it. And they're here, not just on private land, but those big deer exist on public land too. And you start get, get, garnering that kind of attention for something like that. Now, all of a sudden, the DNR has got to actually work to take care of that resource and make it more attractive to the people who are wanting to come here and spend that kind of money. And I, you know, and I know I tend to oversimplify things a little bit, but to me, it's just a no brainer. I don't understand why you wouldn't want to do this. That's right. Um, you're, you're exactly right. And I think about your example is perfect after that video. Uh, and, and I don't know that I've ever even really thought about it this way, but after that video came out the following year or this past season on the velvet hunt, there were so many people you wouldn't even know what to do with all of them. I mean, it was, Mm -hmm. it was insane. And most of those people were not Tennessee residents. And so you think about, and then uh, Clayton, you've been up to Kentucky with me in the early season. Um, I mean, the amount of out of state pressure, just because people can go out there and do it. It's unreal. Tennessee is what 300 and something bucks for a tag. Mm -hmm. Um, And you multiply that by, however many and that's just license sales and then you talk about like we got an airbnb for three days everybody most people are doing something like that they're getting a hotel room they're buying food there i mean that just that yeah. just is so that's so much money that it, it adds up potentially missing yeah. out on four so that people can ride horses i just keep going back to that but yeah um, <laughs> it, 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 it it adds it, up yeah no doubt about it and then and then <clears throat> to to try and and justify like the justification of it it's, it's kind of entertaining on in, in some ways but again it's yeah i think it's more educational just to kind of see how people's mind works and the in the links that they'll go to and the and how far they'll reach to try and keep from having to do the hard work of actually figuring it out and that's what we need to do we don't expect the doors to be flung wide open um i'd love it and i think we'll eventually get there but it's going to be this incremental 
approach to it where you know we'll take a third and then in two you know in another year we'll get another third and then you know once it's kind of died down in the dnr and the legislators don't have to worry about it then it'll get rolled out but um you know it's 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 really um been a, an educational process for me just to see how ingrained that we can get into the 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 status quo and 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 not and just be not just fearful of it just but to almost be angered by the fact that you would even suggest such a thing you know? yeah that's yeah, that's what kills me the most is it's just been the same way for so long and it's just so indoctrinated and like literally the, you know, one of the, the main arguments that I heard at that meeting in Pickens was the the, the guy that was a, a pastor or a preacher at a church just mm -hmm. literally on his bully pulpit talking about how he, you know, doesn't want people to be hunting on Sundays and I'm like, guy, you know, 95% oh, of, of the land, you know, around your church is privately owned and people are hunting it on Sundays already. That's already a thing. Like you're not arguing against Sunday hunting in general. You're literally just arguing against Sunday hunting on public land versus, you know, anywhere for that matter. Like you, what, what are you even complaining about? Like there's, yeah. there, you, you literally already have the problem that you're, you're fighting against now. It's like, being a better we just want to be able to act. Normal people want to be able to access this land on Sundays. Right. He needs to focus on being a better preacher. That might get yeah, it just killed me. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, yeah. I, we'll, we'll wrap this up, Glenn. If you got anything else that you want to share, I think uh, I think we covered I, a lot of it. Man, you, yeah, we, you guys did a great job of, of pulling the information, and I think we covered the bulk of it. Um, the big thing, uh, you know, that if there's one takeaway is we're accessible. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out through either in, you know, Instagram. Like, like I said, I don't, I don't participate a whole lot in social media other than just making sure that I'm uh, trying to keep people up to date on what's going on. But my wife does a fantastic job as well as the rest of the board. And so if you've got questions, <clears throat> shoot those to us and we'll be glad to answer them in any way you can if you're interested in helping out. We're always looking for people to help, uh, whether it's with um, helping with events and coordinate with vendors and, and things of that nature. We're always looking for people that'll step up and help. And just like you've talked about earlier, Parker, if you're not a member of BHA, join because there's power in numbers. If you're a public land hunter in South Carolina, there's really no reason why you shouldn't be a member of, B, of, of backcountry hunters and anglers. And being able to show those numbers of our membership really helps move the needle. Um, one statistic that I'll give you guys, um, and I won't bore you with a lot of numbers, but 24 hours after that call to action went out and we started posting it, there were um, over 1,500 letters, not 1,500 total letters, each one of those representatives on that list had over 1,500 emails sitting in their inbox about Sunday hunting legislation. That, that's how you get people's attention. If there's one in there, they don't care. If there's 1,500 in there, now all of a sudden they start caring. And so share that, get your wives to fill it out, get your buddies to fill it out, um just and, and just make sure that you keep letting these people hear from you because that's the, the legislators have told us is like we need to hear from people if we don't hear from anybody nobody's going to care and when i talked to rep cox that was the main thing he said he's like these people need to know that y'all exist and that you care and that this is important to you otherwise they're going to sweep it under the rug because a lot of those guys that are in the legislature don't hunt. And so how do they know if they, you know, they, they don't know my rep, uh, of, um, Roger nut, who is my rep here in my district. He had no clue that you couldn't hunt on public land and he's a hunter, hmm. but he hunts private land. And he's like, I had no clue. He's like, yeah, we need to get that fixed. And so luckily he's on that committee and, and I've already spoken with him, but yeah, just, 
join membership counts and get involved. Come see us, uh, hang out with us, come grab a campsite for the run, uh, for our little rendezvous that we're having in April and hunt and fish with us. We're going to, going to have a great time there. And like I said, turkeys for tomorrow is going to be there talking to us about their research that they've got coordinated with Auburn university, uh, my alma mater and the wildlife department there. Uh, come to the pint nights. We're going to talk about inshore fishing and our fisheries off the coast. Um, and of course, we'll be talking about Sunday hunting legislation and other issues that we're going to be working on after we get this one put to bed. So we'd love to have everybody there. Absolutely. And guys watching this or listening to it, make sure you share it. Um, not for any purposes of Southern ground gaining any type of following or anything like that, but share it for uh, the things that you've heard Glenn and take Clayton talk about today. Share it for the purposes of um, getting the information out there in an easy, uh, an easy way to get information out there. You don't have to share all kinds of stuff. You just share this one video and people can hear everything about it, everything they need to know, and also what uh, the course of action should be. So guys, thank you again so much for coming on and, and talking with us about this. And uh, we'll make sure that we, we do our part. I'll definitely be uh, filling that out and, and sending sending some awesome. emails so yeah parker i appreciate it man thanks for the opportunity clayton thanks for setting it up it's uh, um it's important and i really appreciate y'all's time absolutely well, yeah thank thanks you. guys